Okay, great. So um, if you're new to this, we've been doing an electoral organizing training series. Um, before we talked about just basic um, electoral tactics and ways to do them. And then we did phone banking 101 last week. So this week we're talking about relational organizing. And this is a training series that some comrades from Austin is Safer When and Democratic Socialists of America Austin are putting on. So it's nice to have partners, right? Uh, so Jacob, do you wanna? Yeah, um, thanks Anna. Um, so overview, bird's eye view, relational organizing and what is it? Um, relational organizing as y'all can see is like a tactic um, within our broader organizing that builds power through our personal relationships and networks. So it means talking to your friends, family, coworkers, et cetera, um, about uh, politics or a specific political campaign and why a candidate needs to be elected and how that will like change and positively impact their life. And, and hopefully, you know, you get on to like how that advances our movement for socialism. So the main thing, right, is that when organizations are doing outreach, they they don't you know they don't often have a relationship with the uh, the full breadth of the universe they need to make an impact on uh, electoral contests especially the larger one so this technique is all about like using the fact and, and taking advantage of the fact that you already have relationships and mutual trust with people and they will just be a lot more receptive to that messaging from you than from uh, some acronym organization, basically, you know, that that might be uh, that might be alien to them, right? Um, and and then you know uh, these organizations, though, if, if they're doing it in a sophisticated way, they have a whole regimen built out on relational organizing. So it it marries the two. Uh, next slide, yeah. Yeah, here we are. So um, you want, you uh, like relational organizing conversations, um, you know, because you already have a, a freestanding relationship with that person, they, in some ways they can like, uh, they can mimic uh, deep canvassing conversations where they're open-ended to a certain extent, although you'll, you'll have an underlying organizational program or objective that you're often trying to execute. So you want them to walk away understanding um, like, that they care about the problem or that it impacts them and and maybe like more like kind of meta to that which problems or which issues that your organization or campaign is taking on are most important to them um who the decision makers are that have the power to fix this if it's entities in the government if it's the uh the housing authority that's um that's messing with their rent or trying to evict them um, and, and, you know, in the context of an electoral campaign, usually it's like, again, the political or the government venue where the decisions on the issues are being made and how we can impact them. And um, likewise, like, you know, they won't take action unless they're pushed. Power concedes nothing without a demand. And in the electoral contest, often this means that like this decision maker is so thoroughly bought out uh, by the ruling class that they have to be replaced with a working class and a socialist candidate. Um, to take that reign of power and, and do the right thing for the working class. Um, and then finally, and perhaps most importantly, that collective action uh, with them involved and the community is how we uh, start to solve the problem. And you know, often electing a candidate is only just the first step or, or just one tactic within a broader campaign to, to drill down and address a policy issue. So yeah. Um, these are some general tips, um, good for relational organizing and probably good in general. Uh, it's definitely, we've talked about this before in the uh, organizing training series, but it's super important to know the issue and your motivations. We, um, the, one of the major things, right, is like, even if your conversational program is about having short conversations with people, or even if it's about having longer conversations with people, uh, you're going to be trying to have a lot of conversations with people, right, which means that even if you have a framework or a game plan, the conversation can go in a lot of different ways based on their feedback, their questions, their concerns, right? So you so you have to be able to nimbly navigate, you know? On the other hand, I don't want y'all to feel intimidated, like diving in there um, is really important to building confidence and knowledge too, but you should come in uh, with your framework and your knowledge about your issues. Um, and, you know, uh, 
likewise, be open to learning about what they care about. And, you know, uh, and I talked, I mentioned this just briefly earlier that, um, you know, you, you, when you're doing relational, um, especially, but just in general, you want to make sure the other person knows that you're like receptive to what you're saying, that it's, you're not, it's not just a monologue where you're delivering a payload to them. You're, you're reflecting on what they're saying and you're, you're really hearing them and you're trying to, uh, trying to show how collective action and or the political campaign or both are going to address like their concerns and the social issues they're facing. And uh, likewise, you wanna focus on building up that relationship you already have with the person. It's really great when a political or an organizing conversation can draw uh, people closer together, but like that's also going to be the galvanizing force that gets them out to an action or you know, you know, gets them out to vote for your candidate or just gets them to take the next step in the movement or the campaign. Um, and then uh, likewise, like, and this is true of like almost all organizing conversations, it's not a debate or an argument. It's it, 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 at best, you know, and when it's going well, it's people learning more about each other, about their lives and about how they think and feel about what's going on in the world around them. So you never want to make someone feel cornered, uh, pressured, or um, or harangued, you know, or like, you know, sort of uh, aggressed against, if you will, intellectually. And, and so, yeah, you, you want to keep the space open and safe. Um, yeah. Quick, quick questions, thoughts, concerns, suggestions, maybe some other tips folks have, or, or yeah, we'll do the next slide first. That makes a lot more sense. So like, this one goes in line with the other ones, like, uh, don't be too stiff, you know, keep it personal. That's part of the advantage of the tactic is that you have a freestanding, pre-existing relationship with the person, and you want it to feel like that, like a conversation, a friendly conversation, uh, or a conversation with family, you know, it should be personal, and that's part of what makes it effective. Um, and likewise, you want to encourage folks, remind them that you're in it together, and that gets them to open up, build mutual trust, and hopefully, you know, have some faith and fidelity in the project, in the campaign, in the movement, and take some further action. Um, and then this is this is a big one. We always do a task or an ask. So that's again all about galvanizing them to take the next step into the movement and and sort of move up that escalation ladder and advance the campaign. It can be as simple as uh, hitting up three friends to remind them to go vote. It can be something like come to our next volunteering event, you know, uh, for electoral campaigns frequently, you know, the first ask is always going to be like vote for the candidate, right, and remind them of the early voting dates and election day. But if you can get them up that escalation ladder, meaning taking uh, more and higher level steps toward the fulfillment of the campaign, that is really golden. And again, it's something where relational organizing has an advantage because you already have that relationship with that person they might, they want to come to a volunteer event with you. You know what I mean? And then this one is, is also like tied in with the last one, right? Follow up with them. Big thing for any campaign or organizing tactic is to follow up with your contacts and your leads and keep them abreast of ongoing developments in the campaign or more opportunities to get involved. <laughs> so yeah, we, uh, sweet. Okay. Uh, I think uh, I, I was going to say like, if anyone wanted to jump in with questions or other tips real quick. Um, just going to pause some for audience pr uh, participation, but we can move on to the next slide and do that later if you guys prefer. And that's all right. Let's keep it moving. It's all good. I'm going to pass it back to Anna for the next slide, I think. Yeah, thank you, Jacob. Um, we can always revisit tips um, later, but uh, I borrowed really heavily from labor notes um, because I think of relational organizing is basically just having a one on one with somebody and especially with the context that Jacob is talking about where, you know, we have near term goals, especially on an electoral campaign, you know, we want people to come out and vote, uh, volunteer, all of those things, um, you know, we're socialists, we know that we're not going to win these fights. Uh, just after one electoral victory, and it's going to be important to continue to build these relationships. Um, yeah, and so Labor, Labor Notes has this amazing Secrets of Organizer um, handbook that I can link later, but um, 
there's steps to an organizing conversation to kind of help you gauge where you're at with the person before you give them an ask. And I think they're great. So the first one is just figuring out what the other person's issues are, like what's important to them. In a workplace, you know, this might be something like uh, safety equipment during COVID or wages, um, vacation time, that kind of thing. In a political campaign, it might be a little bit different, um, but you can think about issues that are deeply and widely felt with people. Um, for example, Medicare for All was so popular and Bernie was so popular for taking it up as his on his platform because most people have an experience with the healthcare system being awful and you know huge medical debt uh, and all that's all that horrible stuff. Um, so when you're having an organizing conversation with somebody, you know it's different in a one-on-one -on -one than at the doors. You're not just going to jump into like, um, what do you think about uh, my candidate or you know this specific policy? You want to you know get a sense of where they're at, what's bothering them. Um, so that's one of the reasons why today we started with, uh, you know, what got people interested in politics? What was their first political awakening? Um, it's, a, it's a good opener when you're having a conversation with somebody and to kind of get at what their issues are. Um, yeah, so you can ask, you know, if you have a more specific issue, you can ask more pointed questions, um, but don't, you know, don't, skimp on this part, it's really important that the person you're talking to knows how they feel about the issue before you ask them to act on it. Um, you know, you want them to be invested in the outcome prior to like giving them a task. Um, so the next step would be once you figured out the issue, you want to agitate, right? Like react to the thing that they're upset with and ask them questions to kind of get them, probe them and get them thinking about, you know, how upsetting it is. They're having an emotional reaction because affordability is so horrible in Austin and they can't, you know, their family members are having to move. They can't afford rent. Um, it's eating into their budget for other important things. And, you know, people are gonna have strong emotions to that kind of thing. So it's good to lean into it and be like, you know, wow, how long have you had, you know, rental problems or how long, how, you know, when, when you had this medical debt, like how much was it? That's so upsetting. I can't believe you had to pay $10,000, you know, just to have your baby in the hospital, that kind of thing. Um, agitate. Oh, is that the same? Not sure how that happened. Um, yeah, and it's a good addition. It's important to point out who's responsible for this shitty reality that you're talking to them about. So in a workplace, that's going to be likely the boss of the company. Um, in an electoral campaign, like maybe it's a specific, um, maybe it's the incumbent. You know, for example, one of our races where we've endorsed a candidate for justice of the peace. Um, the incumbent was evicting people while there was a federal eviction moratorium. Um, so, you know, there are people in power that we can point to. You know, we talked about decision makers and a little bit about power mapping at the end of the last training. Um, but there's people who are in positions to make a change. And it's good to connect this person's issue to those people before you give them your ask. Um, so next is to, you know, motivate them. You've gotten them all riled up. And so now it's time to give them, you know, a plan to win and lay out how we're going to actually do something about this thing that's affecting their lives. Um, the example I put on here is another one from our, one of our endorsed local races um, for a county commissioner seat. So county commissioners, uh, if the, if people or companies approach the county for tax breaks, county commissioners have the power to vote on those tax breaks. And the incumbent in one of those races uh, gave Elon Musk and Tesla tax breaks last year. You know, we're in the middle of the pandemic, the county has plenty of money they should be spending on other things. Um, why are they giving it to Elon Musk? Um, 
So what's the plan to win? Well, we're going to elect a new county commissioner, you know, and then, you know, you could go into your ask after that, but we'll, we'll get to it. Um, just want to point out that making the plan to win and like getting them to take action on these things is going to be difficult if they don't already care about your issue. So that's why it's really important to do the prior steps and connect with them, find out what's, you know, how you can connect your candidate or your campaign to something they actually care about. So that's how we get to making the ask. You've already laid out your plan for what needs to happen to win. And, you know, you're an excellent organizer. So you have, you know, a whole list of things in your mind that you could ask this person to do based on where they're at in their kind of political journey. Um, you know, it's important to, depending on, you know, your friend or family or coworkers history, like you might not ask them to come to a canvas on the first organizing conversation you have with them. Uh, maybe you just ask them to like read an article. That's like I said earlier, that's totally political activity. Just having conversations about social issues and how we fix them is political activity. So it doesn't have to be the first ask you do to somebody it doesn't have to be come to the canvas. It doesn't even have to be vote for my candidate because you're an amazing organizer and you're gonna follow up with them. Um, and you're gonna meet people, you know, you know people already in your life who are fearful of taking action or apathetic and you don't need to like convince them that those feelings are wrong. Um, a lot of times it makes sense why people are apathetic or fearful. You know, they've seen a lot of promises broken by politicians or um, had their bosses retaliate against them for even like small actions that they've taken. So it's completely normal for people to be um, a little skeptical, uh, but you just have to be honest about the reality and, you know, pump them up about our ability to change things. Um, and finally, you want to inoculate them. This is definitely more of something I think of in a labor context because there's a higher chance of like a boss retaliating from somebody taking action at their job. Um, but, you know, it could be good if you're having an organi organizing conversation with somebody that you're kind of working on in the long term and you're trying to get them involved in the movement, um, it's really important to be honest about the, the challenges and let people know that they're gonna experience them because it's gonna come as a huge shock if they take an action and they expect like immediate results after or, um, you know, they get really discouraged with the first defeat. I'll just give an example. Um, in 2020, Austin DSA as part of this larger coalition pressured city council and you know, it was also largely the circumstances with the George Floyd protests, but pressured city council to defund the police by $150 million. Um, it was a huge victory, but you know, as many could have anticipated, the state um, came in and did a state law that would you know, force all of these major municipalities to revert to their 2019 police budgets. So it's good, to, it's good to talk about those things in your organizing conversations because people aren't stupid and they're already thinking about it and talking through it um, allows you to talk about, you know, how we're gonna address these outcomes down the road and, and get them thinking about the long-term. Um, and like Jacob mentioned earlier, you wanna set up a follow-up plan. Um, you know, if you ask somebody to read an article, don't just let it drop off the face of the earth, like talk to them about the article and what they thought about it. Um, you know, always be organizing. It's, it's not just a one off thing that you do. Uh, one on ones are like integral to socialist organizing and we should be doing more of them as much as we can, because it's really how people feel. Um, it's how they feel a part of the movement too, right? Because if you're 
asking people to do something and then you just never talk to them again, you're not building community, like what is gonna make them wanna come back um, if they don't have interpersonal relationships with the people that they're doing campaigns with. So yeah, and I just, I thought it would be a little helpful. We Maybe we could pause for questions, um, but that was a lot. If, uh, if no one has questions, then I thought we could review the active listening um, techniques. We talked a little bit about this last week in the context of phone banking, but it's also relevant um, when you're having one-on-one -on -one conversations with people. Anna, you're muted. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were going to do this part. <laughs> oh, I can. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I did it in the last one, so that makes sense. That's fair. Um, Open-ended questions, affirmation, reflective listening, and summarizing. ORS is the acronym. So it's a model for how to, it's like, it's one model. It's not the only one for how to engage in active listening. Um, which means, you know, you're listening to hear the other person understand and reflect on what they say, internalize it, not just waiting to talk, right? That's basically the idea. So yeah, open-ended questions. What are they? How do they work? Next, next slide, is there not a next slide? Oh, okay. All right, I, we, in the last one, we had individual slides for each one of these. We'll just talk about them. Um, so open-ended questions are what they sound like. They're a question that doesn't have a definite answer, right? You know, like, uh, what, you know, what, what issues impact you the most? Or how do you feel about? Or, you know, things like that, right? That, get, that are provocative, that get them thinking about the issues, how they feel about them, how it impacts their family, their community. Um, and, you know, another, another classic is like, you know, what do you think we can do to solve this? That's like a classic one from labor organizing and starts getting them thinking about solutions. So like the main thing with open-ended questions, right, is like it gives them a platform to express themselves and you get to hear uh, uh, from them, learn about them uh, and what's important to them. Um, affirmation, pretty straightforward. Uh, we, meant, we mentioned this at the top, but it's like you want to encourage people, uh, validate what they have to say. And then like, also while you're affirming, you can help connect that back to your framework, you know, like, yeah, that is really bad. It's been going on for a really long time. Um, you know, bosses make money by extracting our surplus value, you know, that kind of thing. Like you're affirming, but you're also, um, you know, you're also bringing it back to the, to the thesis at the same time. The most important thing is to make them feel safe to express themselves. Like if you ask an open-ended question and then you come down someone's throat, it, it's, it, it's not going to work so well. Right. And, um, reflective listening so reflective listening means like you're doing check-ins while you're listening to them to show them that you're listening and that you're hearing and understanding what they're saying in some ways it's kind of similar to affirmation in that again it reinforces the idea that it's it's safe and it's open to uh, to answer the open-ended question to explore the topic how how they see fit or through the lens of like what's important to them in their personal experience um summarizing is is related to reflective listening um in the sense that like sometimes you do summarizing to show that you're reflectively listening it's it's the thing we do in conversation where we kind of um summate back to somebody what they said to us to show that we understood it but summarizing in this context in the ors method can also mean like moving the conversation forward on your framework toward the ask or whatever is kind of the objective underlying um your organizing effort um, so like you could sum up the whole conversation about like how they answered your open ended question, um, leading them toward how the solution is tied in with your campaign and then summarizing around what the next best steps are based on that solution that you both kind of like came to in the conversation. Excellent. Um, so I included some extra resources. All these slides are going to be available. I've been linking them in the YouTube videos as well, so you can find them there.